Welcome. I'm Amanda McGill Johnson with the Nebraska Coalition for Life Saving Cures, otherwise known as Nebraska Cures. We're a nonprofit that promotes, supports, and advocates for scientific research and education to support our economy and our personal health. Um, so we've been offering a series of webinars on different topics related to science and health. And earlier this year, we held one on climate's impact on health. And from that, uh, from that panel emerged the idea of really spending an hour talking about how to best communicate around climate um, for the variety of reasons like the, the how it's better for our health and, and environmentally. And so we put together a stellar, I think, array of experts and folks with personal experience to talk to us about how we can all be more effective in um, talking to our policymakers, to our neighbors, our family members about climate and how it impacts us so we can really focus on the outcome of changing behaviors or changing policies. So with that, um, Martha Durr, our state climatologist from down there at UNL is here to join us and um, kick off our presentation. Great, thanks, Amanda. Hopefully everybody can see my screen here. I'm seeing it. <laughs> okay, get into presentation mode. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to be on this panel. Um, so I'm gonna talk just um, briefly about Nebraska climate, our past climate and our future climate and talk some about perceptions of climate. And in my role as state climatologist, I have the opportunity to talk to lots of different people and groups um, about climate and climate change is increasingly on people's minds is one thing that I've certainly found. So Nebraska's climate past, just in a nutshell, um, temperatures are warmer now than what they used to be. Our, our rate of change, our rate of warming, is at about the global average temperature rate of change, which is about a degree and a half over the last century. Um, the rate of warming is ramping up, it's increasing, and we things are changing faster now than what they used to be. Um, we have generally trended toward wetter conditions with more of our precipitation falling as heavy rainfall events. So that's um, something that you may have experienced, uh, particularly within the last few years here. We've had quite a few extremes. Um, that's not to say that we don't have drought. Um, we're almost all of Nebraska is currently in drought conditions, parts of Nebraska in extreme drought conditions right now. Um, that has been and will continue to be a normal part of our climate, um, but the frequency and intensity at which drought will occur will change because of climate change. Um, in general, extremes are getting worse with what I call and some others call weather weirding, where we have weather events that are maybe out of context of when we would normally think of experiencing certain types of weather events. And the thing that comes to mind uh, for me is the derecho and the 30 tornadoes that we had last December, where previous to that, we only had three tornadoes ever recorded in Nebraska in December. So these extremes that we experience, they are getting worse. Um, we, in Nebraska, we I like to call it the climate crossroads because it's this intersection of where the humid and wet eastern half of the country meets the more arid and drier half of, of the western half of the U.S. And so we can tend to cycle between too much water, like we experienced um, very significantly in 2019, both the March event as well as some flash flooding events that occurred later in the year. Um, and then the faucet gets turned off and we've been in about a three year drought parts of Nebraska has. Um, so we do tend to cycle up and down uh, naturally because the climate does very naturally, um, but these cycles are intensifying and they will be changing because of climate change. So that was just a, a brief um, intro to Nebraska's past climate. So let's think about Nebraska's future climate, the climate of 2050. So when my kids are my age, what does Nebraska's climate, what is it gonna look like? Um, that trend of heavier precipitation, that is absolutely going to continue. So things like the flash flood event in Omaha in 2021, or, or pick your extreme rainfall event, those are becoming going to become more common 
Um, that's not to say that every rainfall event will be a heavy rainfall event, but we will have tendency to have more of those. So more flash flooding, more implications from these extreme rainfall events. <clears throat> we will also have more precipitation falling outside of the growing season. So the fall and winter time of year, that's when we'll have greater precipitation and summer of Nebraska climate 2050, that's going to be drier than the current climate conditions. So that will certainly have implications for water needs and water usage. Thinking about um, our temperatures, and I'm for this presentation, I'm using visuals rather than um, graphics showing you rates of change. Um, think of, of central Nebraska as looking more like uh, present day southern Kansas in 2050. So our average annual temperature will warm by about five degrees. Um, we will have more heat events, more extreme heat, more days over 95, 100, 105. Those will become much more common. We will have warm nights. So the ability to cool off um, will, be, will be more difficult in Nebraska's future climate. There will generally be less cold events, um, let fewer pests will be killed off uh, during the winter time. So more of an opportunity for say invasive species or things that we um, that we didn't see here before because we used to get cold enough so that certain um, certain bugs and diseases, insects, so forth would be killed off. Well, in Nebraska's future climate, we will have less cold overall and more heat events. Um, all right, so that was a little bit about Nebraska's past and future climate. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time thinking about climate literacy. Um, it, in, in my role as state climatologist, I've, I get a, a nice sense of how people think about climate, how people understand or don't understand the difference between weather and climate, and some of these misperceptions that people have about climate change. Um, so, so these comments here are just based on my uh, seven years of interactions with the public on issues related to climate. Um, things that are understood fairly well among the population is that we cycle and the climate changes naturally. And people certainly understand that. Um, the, however, they also see that things are changing and we seem to be having more extreme weather. Um, the questions, the inquiries, the concerns that I hear are, are increasing. Um, there, we talked about things are ramping up, the concern about climate change and all these extreme weather events are, are ramping up as well. Um, and when these extreme events happen locally, they under people understand that it does impact me in some way. It could be flood, it could be the ongoing drought, it could be the wildfires that we're having um, due to the dry conditions and the high winds. So they understand that linkage between a specific weather event when it happens locally for them. Um, what is misunderstood, unfortunately, is the meaning of weather and climate, whereas weather is the clothes I'm wearing today and climate is the clothes in my closet. Okay, um, And climate change is shifting all of this. Climate change is like the driver of the weather events that we experience, and it's causing more weather events to be more common than others. Um, another thing that's misunderstood is that because Nebraska's climate is so variable, um, the, the weather, the day-to-day, -day, the year-to-year, um, these changes in the weather is sometimes greater than this climate change signal, this slower rate of change, perhaps. So it's difficult um, to, to understand and to extract that signal, which is climate change, from all the noise of weather events. Um, some other things that are misunderstood or that I hear about is changes I make won't matter, um, which is, is not correct. Something that I try and talk about is that personal choices um, lead to greater behavior change for your friends and colleagues, for, um, for those around you, and, and changes that I make in a personal sense do matter and do make a difference when it comes to climate change. Um, 
Climate change already touches us. Some people don't feel that they are impacted currently by climate change in the here and now. Um, and some of us, it impacts much more than others. It's disproportional in these implications. Um, actions we take now do matter and do um, make a significant difference. So if we put mitigative action into place now and in the next 10 years, we will follow that aqua curve where there'll be much less risk and much more manageable impacts and our climate will stabilize. If we don't put action into place right now, it's a very high risk approach. We will have catastrophic impacts and no stabilization with that, that orange curve. That's a global average temperature. So just think of it as a Nebraska average temperature. If we warm by up to eight degrees Fahrenheit and we don't stabilize our climate, that has very severe implications. So action now does significantly matter in the long term. Um, and, and then finally, um, perceptions do matter. Um, there's a great resource, which is the Yale Project on Climate Change Communication, and they survey the U.S. population every year. Um, so I, I'm putting some bullet points as kind of a summary of what those, those surveys are showing, that as a whole, the U.S. population and Nebraska, we think that global warming is happening. That's how they frame, that's the terminology they use rather than climate change. Um, we as a country and as Nebraska support regulation of carbon dioxide as a pollutant. We are concerned about it and we feel that it's harming us collectively. However, we don't see that link between climate change and maybe extreme weather events and we don't feel that personal um, connection to climate change and we don't talk about it. Um, that's that's another another issue that I think is a really big part of the solution, and that's all that this panel is is centered on, which is communication. Um, and this can be a, a difficult subject to talk about. And um, so I'm looking forward to the the other presentations and the dialogue on how do we best communicate about this global problem. Um, and to me, it's all about making it local and relevant and impact for the individual, where they live, and what they care about. That's, that's one of the best solutions is talking about it in a locally specific way. So I'll just end with a quote that I've received uh, from a group that I spoke with. And, and to me, this is kind of where a fair amount of Nebraskans are. So maybe they don't believe in global warming, but they do think we could be doing more to protect our environment. So focus on climate change solutions and framing the conversation on climate change about protecting our environment, about our health, about um, the economy, about conservation. Um, we can frame it in such a way that it, it doesn't specifically say climate change or global warming, but we can take action in this local meaningful way. And I'll just um, leave with, with my contact information there. Thank you, Dr. Durr. Um, if anyone has any questions, now would be a good time to drop them in the chat for her. I really appreciated your slide on climate literacy and the discussion about just what people are experiencing. I know for Halloween, we talked about those of us in Nebraska or in the Omaha area remember Halloween getting canceled a couple of times when we were kids or got moved and now like Halloween weather has been delightful for several years really and my husband who's from Kansas was laughing at the fact that we used to have to cancel it and it was an aha moment about how our climate is becoming more like theirs. Yes yeah good point. And then pivoting that into how there are personal, your own personal changes in your behavior can impact those friends and family around you. I really liked that. And then talking about these issues in, in a locally specific way. So um, we're gonna go ahead and move on then to Eric Pulver. He's an emergency preparedness consultant and he spent some time this summer through his program at UNMC in Alliance. So uh, a guy from Omaha who spent some time in a different community that may have some different perceptions around words like global warming or climate, and he will share a little bit with us about what he experienced and learned. Yes, thank you, Amanda, and uh, thank you, Dr. Durr, for your presentation. Uh, everyone can see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yes. Awesome. 
All right, so uh, yeah, my name is Eric Pulver. Uh, I am about one month away from graduating with my uh, master's in public health and emergency preparedness at uh, UNMC. And uh, I spent uh, about 10 weeks in uh, Western Nebraska, specifically in Alliance, uh, doing some uh, emergency preparedness work out there and uh, kind of learning what it was like to be in a rural area. And so, uh, like I said, uh, in Alliance, I was uh, sent out there uh, by University of Nebraska-Lincoln's Rural Prosperity. Um, I did spend 10 weeks uh, immersed in the culture of Alliance, living there, uh, working there, and kind of, uh, you know, spending my time there. And um, one of the things that uh, sort of struck me is I've lived in Omaha for, you know, 30 years, and uh, Alliance really just felt like a large neighborhood. If you could pick up Alliance and drop it in Omaha, it wouldn't really feel all that weird. Uh, it's also a lot more quiet. There's a lot less traffic, although I did get into one traffic jam uh, in Alliance while I was out there. And another thing that's uh, quite striking to me is just the, the access you have to sort of the community and the town and the regional leaders you know, I was able to to work with, you know, everyone from, you know, Alliance City Council to the mayor to economic development leaders to uh, the leaders at Panhandle Public Health while I was doing uh, a lot of my work out there. And and uh, I just joked about you can't walk into the, you know, uh, Omaha's mayor mayor's office and be able to have a conversation with them. But you could do that in some of these more rural uh, towns. And so that access is really was quite striking to me. And so what I was doing specifically out there um, was dealing with emergency preparedness was I was doing some business continuity planning uh, for the Alliance Recreation Center. Uh, they had no preparedness planning whatsoever. They had uh, one hand-drawn uh, emergency fire escape route that was wrong on the wall. And so uh, I went out there to help them with uh, a lot of their preparedness planning. And including with that is uh, I did risk assessments for not only them, but also for the Sand Hill Center for Hope, which is uh, a burgeoning uh, center, a regional center that they want to do more um, mental health uh, out there in uh, the panhandle. And so a lot of those uh, risk assessment, you know, some of the themes coming out of there do actually relate to sort of how the climate is changing uh, and how sort of like they need to be worried about sort of how, you know, drought and severe weather is going to kind of affect their personal business and sort of how they can uh, be able to, you know, recruit people to come out and work, uh, you know, out there. And then uh, another thing I did was with Panhandle Public Health, uh, I did create uh, and run a uh, inclement weather preparedness uh, presentation for their internal staff. Uh, Panhandle Public Health does, basically runs the public health uh, stuff for about 13 counties out there in Western Nebraska. So they have to travel all the way from Shadron to Scotts Bluff and everywhere in between. And so uh, with sort of the climate becoming a little more destabilized with climate change and everything like that, they wanted to have a better idea of what they can do to be prepared while they're traveling uh, along you know, their routes to be able to go to different places. And some of the, the area, the three areas that I kind of figured out while I was out there that really kind of would help in communicating, you know, not just climate change, but everything with uh, sort of Western Nebraska specifically. And the first one really is this, this talk with them. Um, and and they, they don't really like the sort of official classifications that kind of can come down from the federal government. One specific one uh, that was, uh, I was told about a few times, was that uh, the area was recently reclassified as a frontier from a rural because they've had some population decreases. And uh, just the use, the use of frontier made them feel like they were just dismissed, like, you know, they had been plopped back into the 1800s, they were the Wild West. And they're a very modern area. You know, they have, you know, almost full coverage of gigabyte fiber internet, for instance, where a lot of Omaha doesn't even have that. And so, uh, you know, don't rely only on those official classifications, you know, be able to actually talk to them, you know, person to person. And another thing that was kind of interesting is that they feel very distant from Omaha and Lincoln. You know, for example, to go from Omaha to Alliance, it took me seven hours one way. 
And it, my brother lives in O'Fallon, Missouri, which is about six hours away from Omaha. So it was farther for me to drive within my own state than to go to the other side of Missouri. And so they feel like they're just not really like part of, you know, the Omaha Lincoln conversation sometimes, especially when, you know, they've got all of these events they have to travel to Lincoln or Omaha for. And so a lot of it is they just really want to feel heard. You know, they want to feel talked to, you know, they want people to come, you know, a little bit closer to them instead of having to always come out to the other side of the state. Um, and, but they're very eager to contribute their ideas. They, and they're very eager to contribute sort of, you know, into solving a lot of these issues that we have and discussing stuff, especially around climate change. And so it's just, you know, we got to just talk to them better. We got to do a better job of, you know, going out there to where they are instead of, you know, always forcing them to come to us. And then when you go and talk to them, water was just, I think, in my opinion, absolutely vitally important out there. Um, everyone from farming to ranching to all of the even supporting industries and other industries, they relied on water and they understand water to a degree that actually was quite surprising to me. Um, everyone out there discusses the rain. Uh, if it rains even like a tenth of an inch, it is talked about. Uh, everyone measures their rain. Everyone knows when it rains. If it's supposed to rain, it doesn't rain. That's another topic of discussion. But water is just absolutely incredibly important. And, you know, one of the things I learned is that a lot of people out there, especially those ranchers, you know, they remember what years were dry and what years were wet, probably almost as well as, you know, the climatologists, you know, do. And I could probably, if I dived deeper into that, they probably know what months of those years were wetter and drier than others. And so I think if you go and we, and we, we kind of frame this climate change talk about sort of weather and also water for them, then that they might be more receptive to discussing uh, ways that uh, they can contribute to, you know, helping us sort of with this uh, issue of climate change. And then finally, uh, the, the third one that I really want to discuss is sort of we want to harness their specific type of community resilience. And so a lot of rural areas, obviously, there's less people. So that means, unfortunately, there's you know less resources out there and there's less people to be able to do certain things. But what that does give them is they get they have a high social capital. You know, everyone knows everyone and including in that everyone helps everyone. And so if there's areas that are you know, struggling, then others in town will come and they will help. And so we could harness that at sort of more of a state level, increase the social capital of the whole state by learning from examples in the sort of rural towns like Alliance uh, that, you know, be able to give the whole state that sort of smaller town, rural social capital that we could use to be able to really tackle a lot of these problems. And because of you know the, the issues with you know a little bit less resource, a little less people, they really have a lot of creative and out of the box problem solving. And so if we can bring them in, we can probably get sort of ideas that we weren't ever gonna think of uh, because they're like, you know, they would be able to give you a point of view that we can't really, you know, living in South Omaha, I can't have the same point of view and be able to solve the situation the same way they could. And so just more, ideas floating around is almost always better. And so, you know, being able to kind of harness that as well is really useful. So um, I do just want to say one last quote, which is uh, that in my opinion, uh, when you have disagreements, those lead to discussion, which leads to problem solving. And so I do want to thank you for listening to my portion. And that is uh, my contact information there. Eric, thank you so much for sharing your personal experience. I too am someone who lived in Omaha, Lincoln, spent a little time in South Sioux City living there, but just giving folks who may be from the cities uh, uh, an eye into um, just what people in different communities might be thinking, how they approach issues, and you know the importance of just meeting people where they're at and what's important to them and, and making sure that we're tailoring, tailoring communications, maybe on public policy issues or whatnot, um, around, you know, where people are at in, in different places in the state. So thank you for that. 
Um, we'll move to Rachel Lukadu. Um, she's Director of Legal and Public Health Preparedness at the, in the College of Public Health at UNMC. You have a lot of experience you know, talking about public policy and what we can be doing in local communities. So Rachel, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Amanda. Let me share my screen. Are you seeing the PowerPoint? I am. Perfect. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some policy recommendations relating to climate change and how we can communicate about those policy recommendations. So Martha and I were on the same page with the Yale climate communication map. Um, so before we get into the policy discussion, I just wanted to start with this particular image of Nebraska from the 2021 Yale Climate Opinion Map. And it shows that, like Martha was saying, the majority of Nebraskans do agree that global warming is happening. It may not be a strong majority, but it's a majority nonetheless. And I think this is important because it shows that while we think of climate change as being so polarizing, there does seem to be some agreement that things are changing. Temperatures are getting warmer and people are willing to acknowledge that's happening. So I wanna keep that in mind as we go through some policy suggestions. So I wanna start with some level setting on what we mean when we talk about policy. So the way I see it, we have a few different levels of policy. The first is federal, and this is where we see, you know, these executive orders in the White House, like this 2021 executive order from President Biden to tackle the climate crisis at home and abroad. This is also where we see those big congressional initiatives and laws like the Inflation Reduction Act, which was passed earlier this year. And sometimes more unfortunately, this is where we see decisions like the West Virginia versus EPA case that came out from the Supreme Court earlier this year. So these are all the kind of major sweeping policy actions that can make huge impacts on climate. But for those of us in the community, this is a level of policy that we can't necessarily influence, apart from voting for candidates that we know are going to advocate for climate-minded laws and regulations. So next we have state and local policy. And again, this typically involves the passage of laws, regulations, ordinances, what have you that connect to climate. But this can also include corporate and utility action that relate to climate. Uh, and this can include things like last year when the Nebraska Public Power District, which is the largest electric utility provider in the state, adopted a goal of being net zero carbon by 2050. If you don't know about this, this is a climate win that I get really excited about and I think a lot of other people got excited about too. Um, Nebraska is a demonstrably conservative state and passing state level legislation related to climate has been tricky at best. So to see this sort of action from such a large utility provider is really exciting. One thing I wanna note about this is Nebraska is unique in that it's the only state in the US with publicly owned rather than corporate run utilities. So what that means is that board members of these utilities are elected by community residents. So this movement towards net zero carbon and more renewable energy sources reflects the wishes of the voting public, which is really encouraging, especially in light of Nebraska's largely conservative political status. Because to me, this shows that we can at least take some climate related action without getting stuck and bogged down in politics. So again, all that said, with this level of policy, much like the federal level, our involvement as community members is largely limited to voting, but we can get a little more involved in state and local politics. So finally, we have grassroots policy efforts, and this is where I think we as community members can really make a big impact. You know, we've seen repeatedly what a political nightmare it can be to gain forward motion in Congress or at state legislature level within the realm of climate policy. So taking grassroots measures allows people within the community to take action and speak up about the issues that are really concerning to them as it relates to climate. So I've got three main policy recommendations for community members who wanna get involved in climate change action. And the first would be to find ways to bring together key stakeholders and community members to discuss climate issues. One way to do this is through citizens groups or citizens assemblies, they're sometimes called. And these groups can hold town halls or listening sessions about climate change. And I think taking that step of getting the conversation going and gauging where others in your community stand on climate issues can be really valuable. 
I would say one really important note here is you have to ensure that these groups are inclusive. We know that some of the impacts of climate change and extreme climate events have a disparate impact on some more vulnerable or at-risk populations. So I think ensuring that any group you bring together is really inclusive of all the groups and populations represented within your community. I think one really great example of this is the Washington Climate Citizens Assembly. And this is a group that was convened in Washington State um, last year in 2021 and represented Washingtonians from across the state. And this group started by holding seven learning sessions where they reviewed issues relating to climate change and provided education on the various impacts of climate change and how they could potentially be mitigated. Then after those learning sessions, the assembly got together for five deliberative sessions where they created really specific policy recommendations based on the education they received. And they then shared that with the Washington State Legislature. Since they had those meetings, Washington has actually proposed and passed multiple laws integrating those recommendations. So for me, I love this concept of starting with some level setting education and then turning that into actual policy recommendations. Uh, I think this helps people feel more engaged and invested in the outcomes, which means that these kind of initiatives have more buy-in and more staying power. I think it can be really easy to think there's not much we can do relating to climate change, um, but this kind of group gives an avenue to actually effectuate change. So the second suggestion I would make is really practical, and that's to encourage more local climate-minded action, like advocating for better green spaces in your community, using more local food sources, and supporting smaller businesses to decrease supply chain issues. You know, this isn't, it may not seem like explicitly policy action, but these are the kind of adaptation measures that can make a really big difference within the community. And then finally, I would say getting involved in local chapters of climate focused organizations can be a really great, great way to be involved in policy action. And this could include things like Citizens Climate Lobby, Nature Conservancy, Sierra Club. There's a ton of different organizations within the state that you can get involved in. And they typically have national level backing and funding, which can be used to advocate for change within your you know, local community. So then I have just three quick communication tips about climate change, and particularly discussing climate related policy action. And the first one maybe sounds silly, but take small bites. Climate change is this huge amorphous topic. So break it up, um, break policy ideas and initiatives into smaller, more manageable chunks that people can more easily relate to. I think on a similar uh, or in a similar vein, focus on specific actions you can take. Um, I know for me, I do a lot of work with the water climate and health program that we have here at UNMC. And we've done a lot of work looking at drought and health, looking at very specific issues relating to drought, like air quality and water quality. And breaking up climate change into these really specific categories makes it a lot easier for people to get on board and, and buy into these concepts. And then finally, I would say, Find your connection points that resonate for your specific community. You know, with climate change, we see a lot of these images frequently of you know, polar bears on melting ice caps and sea level rise in Miami. And while those things are extremely important, they don't necessarily resonate in Nebraska. So we have to find what are the images, what are the topics that really resonate with your community? So maybe you live in a community that relies heavily on well water and you've noticed that your water is becoming more contaminated or there's less water quantity due to downstream impacts of climate change, then use that as your point of discussion with your community to talk about climate change. So that's something everyone can, can get on board with. And then I want to close with another image from the 2021 Yale Climate Opinion Map. And this shows that while Nebraskans generally believe climate change or global warming, their term, is occurring, they're not talking about it. So the percentage of people discussing climate even occasionally is very low across the state. So take from this, if you do nothing else but start having conversations with the people around you about climate change, that's a really fantastic first step. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Amanda.
Yeah, Rachel, I really appreciate your focus on those local, more grassroots policies. As someone who's been more engaged at the state level, it's easy to feel kind of beaten down when there isn't more progress, although we also need to celebrate the good things like NPPD's uh, uh, decision to go net zero by 2050 and, and elevate and raise up those positive examples. But, you know, as you were talking, I'm thinking I, we need to work together to compile a list of some of those examples that people can work on in their own towns and communities um, so they can kind of pull from that list and, and look at what they want to tackle first. Absolutely. And with that, I'm going to shift over to um, our Honorable Mayor Josh Moaning from the city of Norfolk. Norfolk has so many wonderful things going on in that community, and um, he is someone who has done really great work along these lines and brings a totally different perspective um, to the table here. Thank you for coming. Yeah, hi, Amanda. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be part of this. I'm going to try to share a screen here as well. Oops. Okay, is that working? Can you see? Oh, you not see yet. It? No? Okay. Leave it to the elected official to screw everything <laughs> up. Okay? I am also <laughs> terrible with technology. So. <laughs> you know what? If I, oops, let's see. Okay, that's not going to work. I'm, I might keep trying, but I, since I'm batting clean up here anyway, and we want to make time for questions, I can be pretty quick. So uh, just by way of introduction, I am a native Northeast Nebraskan. I grew up outside of Norfolk, a town called Battle Creek, um, and then went to the University of Nebraska Lincoln and lived and worked in Lincoln for several years after school, moved back to Norfolk uh, 11 to 12 years ago. And in that time period, um, by, by last count, we've experienced or I've seen three 100 year floods. One of those might've been a 500 year flood, I'm not sure. Um, and two historic droughts, including what we're in today. Some of you might've seen the story recently that Norfolk is experienced its driest year on record um, going back to the 1880s. And so uh, climate change, uh, new climate realities um, are being experienced here on the local level and there's no uh, denying that. And so as a community, um, how we've tried to approach that reality is, say, is by talking about ways we can be part of a solution, even if they're small ways, and even if they might seem perfunctory. So um, the first, I'm gonna talk about three things, uh, renewable energy, clean energy, uh, utilizing our natural resources and enhancing our tree population and, and tree canopy throughout the community. So first, renewable energy, um, Northeast Nebraska, you know, Nebraska as a state has been somewhat slow to adopt uh, to clean energy development, especially compared to neighboring states like Iowa and Kansas and Minnesota. Uh, but that's, we've started to catch up in the last five to seven years. And a lot of the new wind energy development that we've seen has taken place in Northeast Nebraska. So neighboring counties to Norfolk, Wayne and Antelope counties, just for example, um, through the development of large wind farms are now, both counties are looking at about 1300 plus megawatts of capacity in wind energy. And just to give that to some context, uh, 1300 megawatts is about the capacity of the Gerald Gentleman Station, the coal generation facility uh, out by North Platte uh, that is owned and operated by NPBD. So that that's striking. There's that much wind and more in Northeast Nebraska, Norfolk has sat right in the middle uh, of that development as a hub. And we've seen what that has done um, economically uh, and, and socially for our region. It's brought in a lot of investment. It's brought in a lot of new business activity. It's, um, it's meant new farm income opportunities for landowners. It's meant new jobs. Northeast Community College in Norfolk is home to uh, the only accredited wind energy technician program in the state. And whereas a lot of those kids 
had to go to Iowa or Minnesota 10 years ago, 10 years ago to find jobs, they can now stay closer to home um, and work in Northeast Nebraska. And that's a big deal. It's also meant new tax revenues for counties and local governments, which is always helpful, right? Um, so I think fu us finding ways to talk about climate solutions like clean energy development as also economic opportunities in our communities and regions is very helpful. Um, I'll, I'll also add that Norfolk as a community took on in partnership with MPPD, a community solar facility that was established and went online in July. It is an eight and a half megawatt project tied to a battery energy store, storage system. Um, and at that size, it is to date uh, Nebraska's largest solar facility. It was an easy sell uh, for our city council to move forward on a project like that, realizing that by doing so, we could lower energy bills for citizens. So the solar pricing uh, compared to the conventional uh, uh, generation portfolio um, that we that we get right now from NPPD came in about 15 to 20% less. So uh, what that all means is that citizens, Norfolk citizens and businesses by buying into community solar can actually lower their bills. We figure on an average household by about 15 to $20 a month. Um, so again, uh, climate solutions as economic opportunities has been one effective way for us to talk about what can we do uh, to, to, to address this situation. Secondly, I'll just mention quickly um, one of our big uh, quality of life enhancement priorities in the city is restoration of the North Fork of the Elkhorn River. North Fork in a convoluted uh, way is named after the North Fork of the Elkhorn River. It's where the community started. Um, we are undertaking a kind of a back to the future project right now in restoring uh, that waterway, um, cleaning it up, making it an area where it's a people attraction, kind of like a Sioux Falls model if you've been to Falls Park in, in Sioux Falls. Um, and in doing so, we hope people will realize the importance of our local natural resources and things like water quality and the things, the practices that go into improving water quality fall in line uh, with climate solutions as well. And so there's a, um, I think there's a, there's a message there to send to people that uh, these communities like ours that were founded on waterways that uh, uh, were given birth by uh, these rivers, um, they can be an asset to us once again. Uh, they became liabilities over the years due to, due to flooding issues. And the city of Norfolk back in the 60s realized, okay, we have to put in some infrastructure to protect our city. Well, they, they have, and that, that waterway now is flood controlled, which allows us to use it as a recreation uh, opportunity in the community. And also, as I, as I stated, do the education on what go, what is in our water, waterways. Um, uh, you may have seen the Flatwaters Repress did a big story just recently on the nitrate problem in Nebraska. Um, so projects like this is my it's my hope that increasing awareness, if we want to use this water as a resource, again, even for recreation purposes, we, we're going to want to know what's in it, how we're treating it, and hopefully that leads to better practices that can be part of climate solutions as well. Lastly, um, tree planting initiatives. This is the low hanging fruit, I think, that a lot of communities can engage in. Um, Norfolk in 2020, and this was planned out prior to pan pandemic, but it turned out to be uh, advantageous um, uh, given that more people were home wanting to do home improvement projects, but we set out to plant 2020 trees in 2020, and we partnered with our local uh, natural resources district to do that, the Nebraska Forestry Service. Uh, the statewide Ar Arboretum. There are a lot of power powerful partnerships that can be made, uh, communities working with those type of, types of organizations to increase tree plantings, both in public and private spaces and communities. And so we've taken that approach on large infrastructure projects as well, whereas even 20 years ago, um, trees and terraces and green infrastructure probably wasn't even talked about in, in Norfolk city planning. That has been, become a priority because we understand how uh, valuable all of that can be to preserving local infrastructure, but also being part of a, a climate solution. Um, other things, there are other things that we've undertaken, such as a comprehensive public transit system, 
again, not even thought about 20 years ago, uh, but is important in, ter in terms of bringing value to people's lives and also uh, reducing our carbon footprint. Um, that that transit system, which I think is has gotten to a point which is pretty advanced, so maybe one of the most more advanced in the state, is now looking to transition to uh, natural gas, look by natural gas or biodiesel, and eventually electric, um, uh, as far as power sources. And then I'll, I'll end with recycling, another low hanging fruit type thing, but complicated all the same. Um, Norfolk has a, is in a good position to act as a, a, a hub and a hub and spoke model for re recycling within Northeast Nebraska. So there's ongoing efforts uh, to get that program up and off the ground. All of those, all of these things I've talked about are ways to um, talk about climate solutions in a way that is practical and realistic and hopefully brings, add, uh, brings added value to people's lives. So I'll stop there and leave time for questions. Well, so many wonderful things happening in Norfolk. So thank you for all of the work that you've been able to accomplish, you know, during your time there. And I love that focus on um, economic opportunities and the focus on the economics of it and how that is a very effective way to bring more people on board with the issue, which actually leads me to my first question. That, uh, what are the common traps um, that you feel some people maybe fall into when they're passionate about climate and making some of these improvements um, around climate and extreme weather. Would anyone like to field that question? <laughs> I'll start right quick. Um, I think one of the traps on either side is making it about politics, right? Um, uh, political labels have become so distorted. All these things that I've talked about, to me, are, are conservative measures, right? They, the, the, getting to the root of the word conserve and conservation. Um, and so I think uh, people tend to shut down when they um, have been programmed to believe that something is politically left or right or not of their own inclination and stop listening. And so that's again why we're trying to talk about climate solutions as practical solutions in people's lives and take the politics part out of it. Yeah, I would agree. Just to follow on to that, I think sometimes people think, well, I don't see other countries making this move or other states, or they'll compare what's happening here to what's happening elsewhere and say, if, if other people aren't making motion, then I don't want to do that myself. And so, again, I think just taking politics out of it and making it smart um, investments and smart ways that we can manage our resources and and extracting climate change from it and just talking about what we can do locally uh, in a very specific way. I know. Uh, I'll, oh, oh, go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, Amanda. I'll, I'll just echo what both Martha and Josh were saying. I completely agree as much as we can take the politics out of it, which is sometimes more feasible than others, the better we are. But I also think being mindful of the language we use, if there are certain terms that are gonna be too charged for people for better, for worse, then let's try and find other words to talk about this. And I think that can be if saying global warming or climate change is going to be alienating for people, then okay, let's talk about you're seeing more drought with your crops. Why don't we talk about that? Or you're seeing issues with your water. I think just being really mindful in how we choose our language about it can make a big difference too. I know it has been helpful for me to think about like what is the end game and that really is changes in policy or behavior and not necessarily winning a fight about oh global warming is caused by people, you know, um, but really thinking about what is the change and what are the arguments around economic development around health that are the really the better messages to get to ultimately the goal of, of a change in behavior. Which leads us to the next question. If there are just one or two key messages that should be communicated to community leaders or Nebraskans in general, what do you feel those should be? Martha, do you have any thoughts on that to kick off? As yeah. The on climate literacy. <laughs> well, <laughs> um, yeah, I've, I feel that, or the message that I try and get across to people is that actions, however big or small, right now do make a difference. 
um, you know, that that's by far the biggest thing we can do is is act now on it. Um, and keying off something that Rachel had mentioned earlier is talking about it is think of talking about it, communication and having conversations about it as a solution, in addition to reducing your carbon footprint, planting trees, you know, all, all of these things are great and view it as a process. We're not just going to do one thing and then we've solved it. There will be many things over a long period of time, which makes it more difficult to think about it, but frame it such that it's a process and it's not one action and then you're done. It's, it's, it's for the long haul. Yeah, I, I would say too, my main takeaway for any policy makers is to realize that the impacts of climate change are already here. We're already experiencing them in Nebraska. As Martha mentioned, by 2050, it may look a lot worse, but we're already starting to see impacts now and they're happening to all the constituents of our policy makers. So now is a good time for us to take action and not get you know, hamstrung by politics or, or get stuck in that kind of mire, but move forward now. And I would uh, also add that um, we've, we, we know that Nebraska's climate is pretty varied east to west, you know, north south. And so, you know, maybe what works for Omaha and Lincoln, you know, it might not work out in the west. So basically, you know, giving them almost, quote unquote, the permission to tailor a lot of these things to their local area. Uh, I think is a big, uh, a big aspect that, you know, these, you know, areas can then go, okay, I like that idea. It's not going to work here, but can I like just modify it a little and then it will. And so, you know, being able to, to get that uh, across to be uh, to them would be really useful. Yeah. And I would just add uh, for local governments, um, Making sure that people understand how important this is to, to plan and prepare and helping provide the resources for them to do that. Um, I mean, it's it, frankly, it's easier to create uh, sustainability offices in cities like Omaha and Lincoln than it is in smaller communities, right? Uh, but it, I think it's just as important. And um, I think that's where there's an opportunity for uh, state government um, and local governments to come together. Um, state policies to pr provide resources, not necessarily mandates or impositions, right, but um, um, resources to help plan and prepare, whether it's um, disaster control uh, infrastructure or sustainable systems within communities. Um, a lot of those resources, those resources aren't really out there right now, and I think probably local governments and the state government could work together better to help provide them. That comment pivots into a few that we have in our chat that are just asking about communication with elected officials at the state or federal level and that there are things coming up in the legislative session in January that are probably relevant to this relating to public power or, or fossil fuels and, and also just at the congressional delegation. Um, does anyone have any thoughts? I mean, Mayor Moaning, do you have thoughts to maybe kick this one off as a fellow elected official? Yeah. Um, well, I think it's important that our uh, communities tell their stories to our elected officials. I mean, it, it, it's easy when the latest disaster happens for the elected officials to come in uh, for for the day and you know get the photo opportunities. Uh, but then there's there's a lot of work to do um, after and preparing for the next and. Uh, hitting home the message that this is real, this is, this has real life implications in how people live in our communities, large and small. And so, again, talking about it in those, um, those types of uh, real, realistic, real to life um, perspectives from people as opposed to the politics of it, I think is, is helpful. And hopefully that leads to um, uh, motivation on on the half, on the behalf of elected officials to engage uh, public policy wise. Anyone else have anything they'd like to contribute to that? I would just say I, I agree. I think I think there has to be a balance when we talk to lawmakers about you know 
our personal stories and the things that we're already seeing, but also showing some of the economic impacts. You know, I, I wish things were a little more idealized or we could just say like, hey, this is a problem, let's fix it. But I think of a lot of times with lawmakers, we have to be able to show some economic incentives as well. And so I think the more we can show how these, um, these impacts are having an effect on our economy, the more we can probably see some forward motion. And in the chat, um, we're getting close to the top of the hour, so we might run out of time to address all the questions, but um, someone did suggest that talking about climate change is better using questions to people in groups or what issues are you seeing in your area, you know, as a possible way to open the door to a deeper conversation. I think that's a good strategy I wanted to share um, with the group. Um, someone else asked if carbon tax has come up as a point of discussion. I don't know if that has or not. I don't know if anyone else has if that's really an issue being talked about here in Nebraska um, that I'm aware of. Um, I would like to, as we look at wrapping up, leave everyone with the opportunity to answer this simple question. What gives you hope? You know, what makes you think, okay, there's a path forward to prevent what uh, Martha shared is what could happen to us by 2050 um, or 20, whatever, my gosh, 2,000 and 100. <laughs> so um, Martha, what gives you hope? Um, so I, I, um, I'm tasked with updating the 2014 climate report that the University of Nebraska put out. And so that's to be submitted to the governor in 2024. And there was an article published in the Omaha World Herald about this update to the climate report. And it mentioned me and there was a high school student from Papillion that reached out to me saying that, hey, I'd like really like to be involved in this. I'm an activist. What can I do to help? And so she's now an intern working for me and helping out with the project and giving, uh, making sure that the youth are represented and we're reaching out to the youth and other populations that maybe traditionally get missed. And so it's, it's people like her um, that keep me going. And when there's a lot of darkness and a lot of bleakness in these reports that keep coming out. But when I, when I look at her or my kids, that gives me hope and makes me keep going. And I want to be accountable to them and do all that I can do um, for their sake. Eric, what gives you hope? Uh, I would actually say um, that since the majority of us, you know, believe in global warming or climate change um, is affecting us, you know, what gives me hope is actually the, the communication of what we're doing right here, right now is, you know, being able to talk about these things um, because we can't get all of the ideas on how to deal with this and how to avoid the worst of it, you know, if we don't talk about it. Uh, you know, burying your head in the sand is not a valid way of dealing with something, especially as, you know, globally destructive as, as climate change is going to be. And so, you know, getting more people to just come out and talk about it, you know, even if, you know, with the, the you know, politicization of the whole thing, you know, being able to get around that, you know, just to talk to people about what's going on with them and, you know, how that they can sort of contribute and how we can all contribute to this together. You know, it's, it's you know, that's where I'm like looking at, you know, this is good. <laughs> Rachel, how about you? What gives you hope? I would agree with both Martha and Eric. And I would also just say, you know, even the passage of the IRA this year, that wasn't a perfect solution necessarily for, for climate, but it was still pretty momentous. That was a huge law to be passed at a national level relating to climate change. And so I think that brought a lot more visibility to a lot of different issues connected to climate change. And so seeing that sort of motion happening at a congressional level is encouraging to me that maybe we'll see more of that at state levels as well. Thank you, and Mayor Moaning. Yeah, well, from a local perspective, I guess what gives me hope is seeing the buy-in uh, for some of these initiatives that I talked about um, it, it 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago even. Um, I wouldn't have seen Norfolk actively billing itself as the clean energy capital of Nebraska, right? Or uh, 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 buying into this uh, riverfront redevelopment project or um, proactively uh, working on tree initiatives and transit and recycling all those things but they're 
but there has been buy-in. I mean, there's been in a in a pretty con generally conservative area of the state. There's been buy-in for these things again because they are recognized as adding value to people's lives, and I think that's again where we need to start. I want to make this point too, just uh, on policy. I think it's important to remember that. Um, uh, that there's a farm bill, I think, coming up again. And so that conservation title within the farm bill, I think, is just as important, maybe more in, in some cases than trying to swing for the fences on bigger, broader sweeping pieces of standalone legislation. Um, agriculture can play a big role in all of this. And I, I have a sense that farmers want to, um, but like anything, they they need to be motivated and incentivized to, and I think that conservation title can play a big role in that. Well, thank you all um, for taking an hour out of your day to share your experiences and wisdom and knowledge with us. Um, for those interested in more learning more, you can continue to follow Nebraska Cures on the website. You know, follow any of these folks on social media or their websites. Um, take care and have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>